Welcome back to the table. I'm Chef Alex Ritoff, and today we're gonna do a Mediterranean tour. We're gonna do a little buckwheat pasta with sauteed shrimp and fish. We're gonna move on to a fresh homemade focaccia bread with fresh sage and rosemary, a little garlic butter. And we're gonna finish it off with a French chocolate amaretto pot de creme. You don't wanna miss it. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the table. We're gonna make a fantastic Mediterranean pasta dish. It's gonna start out with buckwheat noodles. So I got these great buckwheat noodles and it's made out of the buckwheat flour, which is 28% higher in protein, but the buckwheat is also low gluten. It's not, no, it's not gluten free, but it's low gluten. So we're gonna to toss these into our hot pasta water, our water, and we're just gonna let that go for six to eight minutes and drain it off. So how do we make this pasta? Well, we start with those wonderful buckwheat noodles, which I just went ahead and got some cooked off for us ahead of time. We're gonna utilize um, onions, artichokes, garlic, red pepper flakes, but we're also gonna add some capers, some shrimp, and we're gonna sear it off a little bit of um, Corvino fish, which is an awesome fish that is a nice, tight, white flesh. So we're gonna have some fun with that as well. We're gonna end up finishing it off with a little bit of fresh grated Parmesan. a Little bit of tomato base as well. So I've got a hot pan going on. And what I'm gonna do is add some olive oil to our pan. I'm gonna get a good douse of olive oil, it's good and hot. And by the way, we're gonna saute some things in this olive oil. That's our, gonna be our searing pan. So we're gonna start out with onions. We got some nice, fine chopped onions. We're gonna put them into our pan. Some good searing going on. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm gonna take my tomatoes and I'm gonna add the tomatoes in with my onions. Oh yeah, and that's exactly what we're looking for. A little flame, you like the flame. We're gonna let these meld together, just saute them a little bit. I'm gonna show you how to cut these tomatoes. What we do is we cut the top off of the tomato and then we cut it through the equator, right through the middle. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna squeeze them to get the seed pocket out. And now we're ready to chop. And all we do is we take our knife down through and we chop them like into nice fine little dices. Just that simple. Here we go, right into our pan. That was a great sear and that's exactly what we're looking for in order to get all of these melted down all these different vegetables. So we're gonna take our tomatoes and they're gonna actually turn into a sauce. And there we go. And then I'm gonna take some fresh garlic as this sauté's behind me and I'm gonna lay it on its side. I'm gonna take some fresh garlic pieces. I'm gonna show you how to make a great little garlic paste. So all I do is I just give it a little smash with the side of my knife. Always use the blade away that way it doesn't dig into your hand as you go. Use the heel of my hand and smash it down, just like that. And if you hit it really hard, you might have some garlic flying off to the side or in front and hitting some of your friends. So, I like to hit it nice and soft and gentle. What we'll do with this paste, in order to make this paste, is I'll take a little bit of kosher salt and I'll drop it onto my garlic. At this point, now keep in mind, I've got salt in my garlic, so we're gonna squish this back and forth, and this is gonna actually make a paste. And we're using the salt as an abrasive. And that abrasive is gonna mash it and meal it. Now garlic is considerable amount of oil in garlic, and we're gonna actually extract all of that out onto the salt, and it's gonna make a great paste. And the nice thing about this is that the garlic then has tremendous flavor throughout what you're making, but it also, you can't really see what's there. So flavor, no vision, it's a perfect combination. 
That's what we're looking for. So I'm going to take all this. I'm going to add this right into what we're doing. And this is going to distribute very evenly, nice and throughout the whole sauteed vegetables that we're doing. I'm going to add that salt to it. Now keep in mind, we're going to limit the salt that we're going to add to this later. I'm going to take some capers. Capers are little berries. The smaller ones are called nonpareil. And these are the high, more highly prized. They're all done in a brine. These are little buds off of a tree. We're going to drop in a lot of capers because I think they add great flavor. They got a great saltiness, good, good brine to it. Keep in mind there is a little salt to that. And add a little bit more of the garlic to it. When have we ever put too much garlic in anything? All right, we're going to give this a good toss. All we're going to do is use the pan, the edge of the pan, and push it forward and pull it back. And all of a sudden we'll have ourselves a nice little saute going. It's going to be beautiful. You can see it all starting to meld together. Everything kind of get turned a little opaque. Where the onions, they're letting release some of the sugars that they have in them, and they're going to end, making up, end up making this just absolutely beautiful sauce. Nice Mediterranean style. We're going to let that go for about 15 minutes. I'm going to add my artichokes to it right now, and they will actually break apart all on their own. I'm going to add some crushed red pepper. That's going to give it a little extra zing to it. So I'm going to sprinkle that in now so it has time for the flavors to sweat out of it. Boy, doesn't that look good? I'm going to start moving some things around. Now, to add the extra Mediterranean flavor to this, what we're going to do is we're going to take some lemon. What I like to do with a lemon, this is one of my personal favorite things, the outside of the lemon is full of oil, and that oil has got great, great flavor. It is far, far more flavorful than all the juice on the inside. So all we want is the outermost portion of that lemon. We do not want any of the white in it because that pith is bitter and it'll add a bitterness to it. So all we're doing is I'm just swiping my little grater. It has a little trough in it and it keeps it and holds it right here. We're gonna pull just that outer layer off and I'm gonna add that right on in. We are gonna squeeze some of the juice in I'm getting all that great, great pith and peel. That goes right in. I'll give it a little splash there. I'm going to take the dried lemon. I'm going to move this aside. I'm going to use my hand to capture the seeds. So you're going to see me just go like this and squeeze it. And by the way, if you have any cuts on your hand, this lemon will find it. Just part of the fun of squeezing a lemon. There we go. That's good. We'll squeeze the second half over here. It's going all over the place. It's like squirting right in the eye. Not too many seeds in that one. That's beautiful. All right, we're going to give this a good stir. Get all that lemon moving around. We've got good, oh, this looks beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's going to have a nice little zip to it. This is one of those dishes you certainly can add wine to it if you'd like. I don't call for it today, but you certainly can. All right, so now I've got this shrimp and I've got this fish and we're going to heat this pan up good and hot and we're going to sear those. So I'm going to take these beautiful shrimp I got it at Beaufort Highway Farmers Market. We simply devein them. They're fresh shrimp from the Gulf of Mexico. We left the tail section on it. They're beautiful, they're big, they're tender and they've got just a great look to them. And they're going to, we're just going to get them a little bit seared on either side and they're going to go right inside. At the same time, we're going to take our um, fish, Corvina fish. It's a nice, bright pink color. It's got a beautiful color to it. And I'm going to take this and season it on either side. And we're going to dry it. And then we're going to sear this, and it's going to go right on top of our pasta. Isn't this a beautiful colored fish? Look at that pink flesh right there. So I'm going to take a little of this and I'm going to cut it up into four pieces. Kind of triangular pieces. And I'm just going to pat these dry. Because that's the way we're going to get a good sear on it. I'm going to take a little bit of salt. I'm going to salt both sides of it. 
And as soon as my shrimp are ready to flip, I'm going to throw them into our pasta or into our sauce. And at that point, I'll go in with a fish. So I simply just give them a quick flip. Oh, don't they look beautiful? Just a quick sear is all we're looking for. It adds a nice little crispiness to that shrimp. Gets the tails finished. By the way, the outside of that shrimp has where all the flavor is, not necessarily the meat itself. So that's why all of us old chefs, we keep the shrimp shells in order to make soups and stocks out of. There we go, they're looking good. We're gonna sear that one side and in the sauce we go. I am gonna add a little black pepper to our sauce just to give it a little black pepper dimension. Do you know the different peppers hit your, hit your flavor sensors, your sensors around your mouth in different areas? So a jalapeno might hit you a little differently than a serrano than a red pepper versus black pepper. It's very interesting how they all hit you. By the way, pepper is not an actual flavor. It just activates the pain sensors within our mouth and around our mouth. So what we have is our shrimp. I'm going to take this shrimp. We've got our hot oil. And the shrimp is going to go right in with our sauce. As you can see, it's going to cook a little bit further in there. And now I've got this hot pan, and I'm going to add a little bit more oil to it. And we're going to sear this fish. And at that point in time, I'm going to toss my, once we get that up to speed, we always start with the inside of the fish is the show side. So we're going to start with it down first. And when you lay a fish down into a pan to sear them, lay them down very gently and lay them down closest to you and let it drop away from you. That way, if the oil splatters, what's going to happen is it splatters away from you, not on you. Even though we're wearing this heavy chef's jacket, we still don't want to get splattered all around. I'm going to try one more piece right here on the edge. Now, when you're searing fish, one easy rule is if the fish sticks, let it be. Let it sit there until it releases itself, okay? When it's ready to release from the pan, it'll let you do that. All you do is take your, your spatula and you give it a shove, and if it's ready to go, it'll lift up. If it's sticking, let it be for just another minute or two, maybe a few seconds, and then you'll be able to flip it on over. And all I'm looking to do is get a nice little sear on this. I don't want to cook the fish thoroughly because there's nothing wrong with having a medium rare seafood. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm going to take this fish and I'm going to see what kind of browning we have on it. Nice little browning going on there. You can see it, it lifted right up for us. I'm going to let these other two pieces go just a little bit further. In the meantime, I come back to this pan. I got this that I'm stirring with. And you can see some of the liquid has concentrated on me. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. So we're going to stir this all up. And this is looking marvelous. It's exactly what we're looking for. Look at those colors in here with those capers, with the green, the tomatoes, the onions. I'm going to take my buckwheat pasta that I've already cooked. And I'm going to take something to reheat it right off the bat. Just going to drop it in right into the corner. I take a little bit more for another serving right into this corner. We'll put it on down. Just work our way down in there. And then we're going to let this just heat up a little bit and pour some of the sauce on top. All we're trying to do is reheat these noodles just a little bit. We don't need to cook them anymore. We'll let that sauce get in with the noodles. We'll marry them. Let that flavors enter into the buckwheat. A great looking color with that buckwheat, isn't it? All right, we're just about ready to plate, and this is a great moment, this is a key moment, where you can see we're still sauteing over here with our pan still sizzling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of our pasta, put it in the center, put it in the center of a plate. So I'm going to take a little of this right here. I'm going to bring my plate over a little bit. I'm going to take some of this pasta and I'm just going to twirl it around a little bit. I'm just, I'm just going to give it a little twirl. Try to get it up a little higher, a little taller. All right. Then we come in with the, with the shrimp. We're going to go right around the top with the shrimp.
and these shrimp look beautiful. Nice and big, and they're brown. They're seared just slightly, and they look so tender. We put a few pieces right around there, and now I come in with the sauce right on top. We're gonna layer it right across the top. A little bit more, I think, is necessary. So we gotta have plenty of that sauce. All right, now I've got my seared fish. I'm gonna go across, there we go, and that's exactly what we're looking for with this seared fish. Nice char sear on the outside. You can see the browning going on. That's the caramelization of the proteins. It's beautiful. It's exactly what we're looking for. So what I'm gonna do, we can turn off our heat. And I'm gonna take one of these pieces right here. Just gonna give it a second on that side. I'm gonna pull it across and lay him right across the very top. And folks, we have a fantastic pasta with buckwheat, shrimp, and fish that's been seared. And we'll just make a little bit of a garnish and we'll be all ready to go. Start of our great Mediterranean meal. Almost there, there we go. A little bit of a lemon going right on either side. One, last, one added little touch that we should do with this is take some Parmesan cheese and grate it right across the top. Gorgeous. Love those shavings going right across the top. So here you have it. An absolutely beautiful Mediterranean pasta that's healthy, keeps us happy. Next we're gonna do a beautiful focaccia bread. That's a flat pan bread. It's kinda like the bread of Italy and we're gonna be right back. You don't wanna miss it. Now we're on to focaccia bread. And this bread is one of the staples of Italy. It's a pan flat bread. And we're gonna make this almost like a pizza dough. So we're gonna start out with um, bread flour, which has a little higher gluten in it than other flour. I've got a little bit of malted milk, a little bit of sugar. We're going to use rapid rise yeast in this. We're going to use a little bit of, well, we're going to use a little bit of salt, some olive oil, and we're going to put in some hot water about 115 degrees into this mixture, and we're going to make it right here in our food processor. It's really simple, really easy, and you need to do it at home. We're then gonna take some sage, fresh sage and fresh rosemary. We're gonna chop those up. We're gonna put it on top, add a little bit of kosher salt, and we're gonna make then a garlic butter to finish off this bread when it comes out of the hot oven. So let's start. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our yeast and I'm gonna put it in our processor. I'm gonna just cut open the bag. We're gonna let that yeast come down in the bottom of our bowl. And then we're finished with that. I'm gonna add the malted milk. I'm going to add a little bit of sugar, and the sugar, um, there's many different ways of using sugar with this. Sometimes it's to sweeten the bread, and other times as well, it's also used as fuel in order to create the leavening agent for the yeast. So we're going to add a little bit of salt. Salt is going to help us add some color to this when it actually bakes. I'm going to then add, um, where's my water, right here, some hot water, tepid water. I'm gonna add this, it's about a cup and a half into our bowl. I'm gonna put on the lid. And we are gonna then just mix this up real well. All right, at this point in time, we're actually activating the yeast and the sugar's blending, so is the salt, so we're actually making a seasoned water. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil into this, about a tablespoon or so, and I like good, good olive oil. This is extra virgin olive oil. I'll stop. Open it up, and I will pour my four cups of bread flour right into the bowl. This is how easy it is. If I have my mixture right, we will then have a dough ball to work with. So let's give this a go and see how we do. And it should make us work just a little bit. And look at that spin around. 
if it does not form a nice dough ball, and actually kneading this right now, it doesn't form a nice dough ball, we're gonna add just a little bit more flour to it. I have a little bit standing jive just right here in case. I'm gonna give it just a hint. Oh, it's looking good. There we go, it's a little sticky. That's exactly what we're looking for, just a little stickiness out of that dough. So, what do we do next? I got a little bit of flour here. I'm gonna take it on my cutting board. I'm gonna put a little on my hands. We're gonna open this bowl, take the bowl off, and I'm gonna pull this dough straight out. And when you knead this dough, which means that we're actually working the dough, that's when the actual glutens start to adhere. And when we adhere the glutens, what we're actually doing is creating a tough little spot so when the yeast starts consuming and starts creating a gas, believe it or not, yes, it's making a gas, and it then creates that leavening that we have going on. So that leavening is what actually makes the bread dough rise. So we're gonna take this, and I'm just using a little bench scraper here to keep it, got a little flour on here. And I'll keep this flour by just in case. So we're gonna spread this out just a little bit, and you see how it's pretty much staying where it is. It's not actually springing back. So what we wanna do is create those glutens so it stretches and it brings those things, it, it actually comes back. I'm gonna try to get a little bit of flour underneath it. That's what we're looking for, a little flour. And what we do is we take this and we just take a piece over the top and we use the heel of our hand and we put it in and we keep on folding over in a little triangle, right like this, and you can see that what we're doing is we're pressing that in and you can see it's starting to spring back on us already. And this is the key to dough, is to make it spring back. See that come back again? It's starting to pull away. Just a simple couple of, of kneads. This is called kneading the dough with a K. How about that? My English teacher from high school would be very proud of me. All right, so here this is. We got a little ball and it's all ready to go into our bowl. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil into the bottom of our bowl and we'll swish it around to the sides and I take it upside down and I roll it around in the bowl and then I flip it right side up and then we let it rest for two to three hours and this turns into, it rises and gets light and airy and that's what we're looking for. And what I'm gonna do is put this into our proofer. And the magic of television, I just happen to have some more dough that we did just a little bit earlier. And this is how tall it gets. And that's just after I punched it down. Let's look again. We have the original dough, the exact same recipe done a couple hours earlier. And this is how tall it gets. And you can see when I pull it away, it falls right down and there's big air pockets in this and that's what we're looking for in our dough. So, I've got this dough. I'm gonna lay it out. I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil onto our pan because we're gonna get ready to cook. This is ready to go in the oven. I'm gonna take this right out of the pan and I'm just gonna start moving it around. You can see the air pockets that are in it. I'm gonna lay it right on my sheet pan and I'm gonna just start pulling it out. And you can see it springing back but it's very light and airy. So it's got a beautiful glisten to it. That's exactly what we're looking for. I'll turn this around. We're gonna make this sheet dough. And you, by the way, this is a great way to start with a pizza right here. And we do this often in my house where we'll actually put whatever sauce or ingredients you wanna put on top and you make a great pizza with this same exact dough. So I'm gonna spread it out to the sides. And by the way, focaccia is typically a very rustic type of um, bread. So, is it perfectly uniform? No. And they put little dimples in it with your fingers, to, little indentions. So in doing so, we can then, um, our herbs will fit in those little peaks and valleys that we create in the dough. And that's kind of a nice way to approach it. It's not always the same thickness all throughout it. So we're going to let this rest right over to the side. While that happens, I'm going to take some fresh herbs. And I've got some fresh sage right here. I'm going to just take some leaves right off the top. Right here, that's about enough right there. I put them right back in the water. I like to keep my fresh herbs in water and that way I keep them for a couple of weeks if I need to, but I don't usually keep them that long because I use them too quickly. 
going to pull a couple sprigs of rosemary out. I love rosemary. I grow it in my backyard. We take the sprigs right off. These are like little tiny pine needles. It's very strong, very fragrant. You can't miss the smell of rosemary. I use it all the time in several different dishes that I use, that I do. I'm going to take my knife, pile it up high, and we're just going to make a nice little coarse chop. Because we want to be able to see these, the herbs, on top of our focaccia. We'll just take this and just do a little fan across it, and that actually makes nice little, nice little tiny pieces. And um, this is a very, very common pairing of herbs to go on bread. So I've got this great combo here, and all I'm going to do is just sprinkle this out in a nice even layer across our bread. And when this cooks, oh, the whole house smells just so wonderful. Actually, everybody knows in my whole neighborhood when I'm making this bread because it just, I pipe that scent all the way to the outside. All right, so here we go. You don't want to waste any of that. It's all in. I'm going to press it down into the dough just a little bit so that it'll stay because we're going to top this off. We're going to finish it with the garlic butter in the end. Now, I'm going to do one last thing. Take a little sprinkle of kosher salt. I'm going to sprinkle it from up high so it have a nice even spread to it, nice even pattern. And that looks like it's just about right. And we're about ready to go in the oven. I'm going to let it rest for one more minute right here. The next thing we're going to do is make our topping for it. We're going to finish our topping. So I'm going to take a little bit of really good high quality butter. And I'm going to put this in to a little bowl. And I've got some chopped garlic. Nice coarse chopped garlic. It goes right in here. We're going to make a little garlic butter. You can make this in advance. I usually have this just sitting around the house. And all I'm going to do is mix this together. Mix this all together and soften butter. And it does make a difference. You need to use good butter, a little bit more expensive. And there we go. We're ready to top off our focaccia. So what we do. Next thing is our focaccia needs to go in the oven. So what we're going to do is take this focaccia at a 400 degree oven and we're going to move back and put it in the oven for about 25 minutes. And when it's finished, it comes out and it looks just like this. And it's nice and hot and you can smell it and the herbs are brown. And all we're going to do is take a little bit of our garlic butter. And we're just going to roll it over top of it. We're going to cover it from side to side all over with that garlic butter. Just a nice little coating. You can put as much or as little on this as you want. And we've got this great outstanding focaccia bread right here. I'm going to put it right on our cutting board. And then we cut it for the family. It's warm. It just smells glorious. Absolutely wonderful. So when we come back. We're going to do a chocolate amaretto pot de creme, French style, in little cups that everybody gets a single serving. You don't want to miss this. It's absolutely a great way to finish this Mediterranean meal. So stay with us. Now to finish our Mediterranean meal, we're going to do a French amaretto chocolate pot de creme. And the pot de creme in the French cuisine is a little pot of cream. And it can be with chocolate, it can be with vanilla, and it's really, really beautiful, really luscious. And we're going to show you how to do it right now. So we're going to start out with a little heavy cream, a little bit of milk, amaretto. We've got eggs, chocolate, and the chocolate has to be good. 50% cocoa or better, and I think this is 54% cocoa. And we've got a little bit of sugar, a little bit of vanilla, and I'm gonna show you how to use eggs as well. One of the things that we have to do with this is melt the chocolate. And since we're working on a Wolf range top, we have an ultra, ultra low on the Wolf range top, and I can put, instead of a double boiler, I can put my chocolate right on the ultra, ultra low, and 
it will melt right here without burning. So that's what we're doing. So we're throwing our chocolate in, and we're melting it, and we're gonna let it go until it just turns into a nice little melted, ooey gooey chocolate. In the meantime, I'm gonna take some heavy cream. I'm gonna put them in my pan, and we're gonna scald it just a little bit. So we're just gonna bring it up to a light simmer. And I'm gonna thin that out with um, a little bit of milk or half and half. All right, about there, that's about a half a cup to a uh, full cup. In the meantime, while that's going on here, we're just gonna make sure that that doesn't boil over or even boil up. All we wanna do is get it to a little bit of a simmer. I'm gonna take my eggs. These are egg yolks. They've already been, here we go. We'll just pull them and put them in my bowl. We're, gonna con we're actually gonna wanna assemble everything right here in this bowl. Very, very simple. It's like making a custard. So instead of, um, I'll just show you the easy way to take the egg yolk out. Some of us go like this and we do the slinky method. That's where we go back and forth and we drop it on in. Okay, that's the slinky method. This is how the chefs do it. They take the egg and they crack it into their hand and they let it slide through and bingo, we're ready to go. What do you do with the egg whites? You can use them for an omelet on another day. Put them in the fridge and they're very, very useful. If you also you can use these egg whites um, and feed them to the animals, it's great protein. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to add a little bit of sugar to our egg yolks. And I'm going to blend this in. I'm going to take my vanilla, just a hint of vanilla, just like that vanilla in here. We're going to add it in. We're going to blend these two together. This is all while our chocolate and we're scalding our milk and cream. I'm going to add some amaretto, which is an almond flavored liqueur. Is that enough? No, I think we just need a hint more. And we're gonna stir this in. All the while, we're just gonna let that sugar melt in to our egg yolks. So, while this is all working, while our um, cream, so what we're gonna take is our cream that's a little bit warmed up, and we're gonna actually temper the eggs. So we have eggs right here. If we poured it all directly in, it would turn into a curdled egg and what we're really looking for is a nice blended smooth creamy velvety mixture and that's what we're going to get. While we're doing that we have these pots over here. These are my pots used for the pot de creme. In France oftentimes they'll have lids and put them right on there. What makes this special is we're going to take a little bit of water and we're going to put it down in the bottom of our pan and then these are going to be sitting in that. So what we do is we create a little bit of a bath for them to when we put them in the oven and we'll put them in there for about 30 minutes and we'll seal them up. And at that point in time, they'll actually turn into a nice soft custard. So I'm just about ready with my milk and you can see the sheen on top and that's all we're looking for is a little bit of a sheen on top. See what we have there, a little bit of steam coming off. We're not boiling this. You do not want to boil this. There's no need for it. Now we're gonna come and temper the eggs. At the same time, you can see our chocolate's melting real well. And I'm just gonna get them all under. And I can handle this, by the way, it's not too hot. It's fairly warm. And we're gonna get them all under. By the time I temper the eggs, the chocolate will be ready. So I'm gonna bring this over. And while I'm stirring this, I'm gonna put just a little bit of this in at a time. And I'm gonna just let those eggs absorb that hot liquid. And it's called tempering the eggs. We do in a lot of different things for desserts. Oh, there we go. And that just also made all the sugar melt for us. By the way, you can use other things besides sugar. You can use agave. You can use other things as well. So this is what we got here. Nice little creme brulee type of batter. It's almost like a batter that we have here. So my chocolate is just about there. Let me see what I can do with that chocolate. I'm gonna take a little spoon and just make sure they go down in and that we get them all melted. You can see what we have here. Doesn't that look beautiful, by the way? If you don't try your chocolate and taste it and see that it tastes good, because that's a key ingredient here, if it's not good chocolate, if it doesn't taste good, guess what? No matter what you do to this, you won't be able to make it taste good. So I'm sure that everybody needs encouragement to try chocolate, don't they? All right, I think we're there. So I got my chocolate here. I'm going to take it over and we're going to add that to our mixture. I'm going to put that right there. 
and down it goes right into our mixture. I'm going to stir it in as we go. And you can see how that all blends in. It's still really nice and warm. We're going to take all that chocolate. All of it goes in here. You don't want to leave anything left over because this is what seasons this whole pot de creme. Chocolate amaretto pot de creme. You can see it's a beautiful looking mixture, nice and dark. You don't really want to whisk it too much. You just want to blend it. That's all we're looking for, just blending. All right, so now we have this great mixture, right? This is a batter. And it's got eggs in it that's going to help bind it. It's going to make it into a custard-like. So once I have this just kind of mixed together, you can see it's all melted and all mixed together. I will take this and we're going to pour this into our cups. Just about three quarters full. And if you have a little extra batter, make one extra one because it's great the next day. If you pour it quickly, you'll get it in the cups and not around it. There we go, and I have just a little extra, and I'm going to save that for another day. All right, we have our cups full, as full as we want them. We're going to take this, we're going to cover it, and seal it. With our foil, and then we're going into the oven. Just going to pinch the edges to make it a bit of a seal. All right, so here we go. We're going to take it, put it in the oven for about 30 minutes, and we're just going to make a little bit of a custard of it. So that's what we do with this. Put it in the oven, hit it for 30 minutes, and I just happen to have a couple of them that we made ahead of time. So I'll take a couple of these out of the refrigerator because when they come out of the oven, you want to take these and put them in the refrigerator for four hours or more could be overnight. So the way we're going to garnish this is I have a little bit of whipped cream. Can you imagine? Just a dollop of whipped cream on top, just like that. It helps you blend right in. And then I'm going to take one of our chocolate chips that we melted and I'll put them right down on top. And I like to do things in odd numbers, so we'll leave one there. And there we have our chocolate amaretto pot de creme. Isn't that delightful? Well, listen, I want to bring that all in. And here we have our Mediterranean buckwheat pasta with tomatoes and garlic and capers and shrimp that have been seared on buckwheat pasta. I do have to mention that you do not have to put all that protein in the buckwheat pasta. You can keep this vegetarian very, very easily because there's so much protein already in the buckwheat pasta. Um, and I might add that that buckwheat pasta is low gluten. Not no gluten, but low gluten. And also we're accompanying that with our, our Italian focaccia bread with fresh sage, rosemary, and a little bit of garlic butter on top. I also want to thank Theron, who allowed us to film in this great studio at Guy T. Gunther's, and also to the Beaufort Highway Farmer's Market for giving us these wonderful ingredients to work with to make this great Mediterranean meal. And I also have to thank Chef Shea Markwell for being there for me behind the scenes. I'm Chef Alex Retoff bringing you back to the table. <laughs>